Hey, hey, VC. Hope everybody's doing well and had a great week. Um, seems like it's only been minutes since I filmed my last video because of uh, a very, very busy and productive work week. I did a lot of travel this week. I drove over 1,200 miles. <sighs> Exhausting, but um, got all my work done down in South Texas, down in the Rio Grande Valley part of Texas. If you happen to know what Texas is all about, you know it's a long way from where I live. And, um, uh, you know, just uh, grinding it out, just trying to make the most of every day, and um, got back late last night, and um, today was kind of catch-up day, so got all my mail that was accumulated at the post office, and um, just really kind of catching up at home, and, um, you know, just a mountain of email that I never got to because of a uh, long, extended uh, travel week, so good to be back, and good to have you with me. Um, last week's video was it, is going great. So I was kind of like, well, should I even film a video this week? Because I think a lot of people still haven't seen it. So if you're interested interested in Record Store Day and, uh, you know, my thoughts on the day and what I picked up and things I left behind and all that good stuff, uh, the video is doing very well. It's last week's video. Just go to uh, my uh, video log and you'll see it. It was the last video I uploaded. And <coughs> it has, <clears throat> excuse me, almost a thousand views already. So... For me, that's that's a lot because uh, you know this is still a young channel, still starting out, and you know trying to build uh, momentum here. And it's um, sometimes things go well and sometimes they don't. And last week's video seems to have struck a chord, and a lot of people are interested in watching that. So I'm very very happy, and uh, particularly happy with the amount of comments that I get. Um, you know, I don't have a tremendous amount of subscribers under 200. And, um, you know, I have really loyal viewers, so I um, appreciate, you know, let me tell you first and foremost, thank you so much for all those people who take the time to comment, and some of them are very thought out, and I can see that some some time is taken to do that, so it means a lot to me, it gives me encouragement to keep going on this channel, and I um, just want to say a personal thank you to all those people who are watching particularly those who are watching and commenting, and of course my subscribers, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, today we're taking a kind of a turn back to what this channel started at, and that is a collections type video, and um, I'm going to be doing, obviously, you know, the, from the description today is a U2 uh, ranking video, so um, I guess without further ado, we'll get right back in there uh, and, and start that, but I, I do want to do a quick shout out to a good friend of mine who just celebrated a birthday, and uh, that birthday was Thursday, and um, Ross Goodall, who is a, a really great member of the vinyl community, very actively making videos. You can see a link. He's in one of my favorites um, as far as the uh, uh, favorite channels thing goes, and um, not that active on Facebook. He does occasionally post on the VC page on Facebook, but just a stand-up guy, one of the younger members in the VC, and um, a, a really good guy, a big Beatles fan big uh, ELO fan, and, um, you know, Paul Simon, Simon and Garfunkel, um, things of that nature really uh, are what Ross is all about. So happy birthday, Ross. Two days late, but you did get a message from me, and, and I, I'm glad that you got my gift, and um, I hope you had a great birthday. So many more to come, and um, hope you had a great day celebrating. Okay, so I guess that kind of wraps up the shout-outs uh, for this week. And uh, we'll get right to the ranking. Um, I'm, I'm really biting off quite a lot here this week trying to do a, a U2 ranking. Really hard for me uh, because U2 seem to fall into a category of three different things. People who love everything they've done and really followed the band from the beginning and kind of, no matter what they put out, support them and, and, and seem to like just about everything they, they do. Then there's those that uh, kind of after the 80s and early 90s kind of say, okay, that was my YouTube period, and now that, you know, the, the stuff that they've done, say, from 95 to 2000 onward is just not my thing. Um, that's the second category. And then there's a category of people who are very outspoken and say, I hate YouTube. I hate everything they've ever done. I hate Bono. I hate the politics involved with it. I hate the messages that they, you know, just all negative, negative, negative. And I think of all bands that I like... U2 seem to be the most, um, I won't say controversial, but I think they're the most um, full range of people who really like them, people who just absolutely hate everything they've ever done. So, 
You know, I guess if you two aren't your thing, you're probably not even watching this video because there's no point in watching it. Um, I obviously fall into the category that I mentioned first, and that is kind of one of those people that kind of tend to love everything they've done. So to do an album ranking for you two is, is quite challenging for me. So um, by no means, if you see uh, the 13 studio albums here, uh, which is what U2 has put out, uh, something at the bottom, by no means does it mean I don't like it. Uh, kind of the same thing I said about Paul McCartney and the same thing I said about ELO. It's very difficult to rank albums when you really tend to like them all. So uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of good comments again. You can, guys can leave me comments about your ranking. We'll do some comparisons and tell me why you think a certain album might, I should like more than the other or vice versa. So with that said, we'll get right to it. There's a couple things, obviously, I'm not including in the ranking. I'm just doing studio albums, so I'm not going to be including live material. I'm not going to be including A Blood Red Sky. Um, this is a real standard uh, album that I'm sure most of you two fans love. Uh, this was recorded in Red Rocks, which has, you know, I, I got to tell you, and I don't mean to say this because I'm bragging, but this is a concert that I actually attended. So, you know, this concert is it has particular meaning to me. Those who know me well know I'm from Colorado, and Red Rocks is in Morrison, Colorado, a uh, suburb of uh, Denver, uh, up in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, personally, it is the greatest concert venue I have ever been to, and probably will ever be again. Um, I hope to make it back for another concert there someday, but I haven't lived in Colorado now for... 13, 14, about 15 years almost. Um, so age is catching up with me, but um, this, this, this is a magic moment for me and something I'll never forget. In fact, after the concert, I remember hearing on the radio driving back that uh, the DJ was saying, hey, I just uh, saw the uh, next biggest band in the world. This was a magical, magical night. You guys who have seen the video know it rained the entire time. It was miserable conditions, cold, and you two put on a performance that uh, many people, including myself, will never forget. So uh, I can't include it in the ranking because there's no uh, live, it's all live material, but um, certainly worth mentioning because of my concert experience. And I'm not including, of course, Wide Awake in America. I believe there is also a version that's called Wide Awake in Europe. Um, this is, again, a live EP and uh, doesn't count in the uh, 13 studio albums. So, we're going to get right to it and, and start with the uh, least to best, I guess you could say. Start with the bottom and work our way towards my personal favorites. And, you know, a year from now, six months from now, whenever I look back at this, I might say, oh, you know, sure is different now. And, you know, it's, again, one of them bands that tends to vary a lot. So, um, I'm going to just start with number 13 and get right into it. And again, keep in mind that there are, in my opinion, no bad U2 albums. So, uh, the least favorite at this point in my life, anyway, is the album from 2009, No Line on the Horizon. While it's a good album and it has good songs on it, one of the things that has always resonated with me the most with you 2 is the uh, lyrical content and messages and the strength of the lyrics that Bono writes. And this album lacks a little bit of that, in my opinion, although there's some really good songs. It doesn't have the cohesive flow of many of the albums I rank higher, and um, that's why I'm putting it in the last position from uh, 2009. This is a double album, um, uh, 180 gram. My copy isn't the best, but um, you know I think I got this on sale at a very, very deep discount because it has some flaws on it, but no matter, the vinyl was perfect and uh, di didn't mind that it has a few dings and dents and maybe just a little bit of discoloration here, sticker maybe, but uh, no no big deal. Um, anyway, uh, getting back to the music here, No Line on the Horizon is a good album, I encourage mm -hmm. you to listen to it. It's a very fine effort, um, it just again lacks a little bit of the cohesion of most of their other albums and um, a little bit lacking in the lyrical side of things as far as I'm concerned, and they picked the wrong single to start things off with. Uh, they picked uh, the, the, the really cheesy track, Get On Your Boots, and I, I don't know what, what, what was going on in their mind at the time. Many of you might like that song, and it's great, but for me, that was the wrong choice for, for the first single. If they, had, if they had picked Magnificent, or if they had picked a Moment of Surrender, or even the last track, I love the last track on this album, Cedars of Lebanon. 
Um, that's the U2 I know and love. Get on your boots is not the U2 I know and love. Although, you know, it was a catchy iTunes commercial and all that, um, it didn't do it for me. So I think that's what kind of made this album stall a little bit. And it was not their uh, finest moment on the charts either. I guess I should mention too quickly that um, U2 uh, was recently named the 22nd best band of all time uh, by Rolling Stone. And that's, uh, you know, say what you want about Rolling Stone again. It's a reputable magazine that's been around for a long time, 40 plus years. So if they rank them number 22, it still has merit and clout in my book. Um, they've had seven number one albums in the U.S. They've had nine number one albums in the U.K., uh, 11 top 10 albums in America, so most of their catalog has gone at least top 10. Seven of those albums in the U.S. went to number one, and nine of their studio albums in the U.K. went to number one. Um, and of the 13 albums they've sold roughly 120 million copies of, their entire uh, studio catalog, and that's a massive amount of records, and the longevity of U2 and the um, importance of the band is really second to none for this generation. Um, so that's my little hype and, and spiel about U2 as we move on here to number 12. Number 12 is, is an album that has mixed bags for me, and it was very different and experimental and um, uh, really threw a lot of people a major curve when it came out, and that's 1993's Zuropa. Zuropa was a completely different album than what U2 had ever done before. It has songs like Numb and Lemon, and um, you know, there are some really great classic songs on here, though. Um, Stay Far Away So Close is a wonderful track that sounds like it could have come right off of Octung Baby. Um, and then there's others like Daddy's Gonna Pay For Your Crash Car that are just a radical, radical change of uh, direction for you 2 and I'd have to applaud them for trying new things and not sticking to the formula, and this is probably the finest example of that. There's one or two others where they really go outside of their comfort zone and do something different, and um, not a bad album here by any means, but I do put it in number 12th position, um, even though of the uh, 10 songs on here, I'd say maybe about 6 or 7 are, are ones I actually really like. So. 1993's Zuropa. Most of these albums have all been followed up by a massive world tour, and of course you all know U2 can sell out stadiums around the world without any problem, and uh, are probably the biggest, if not, yeah, probably, probably these shouldn't even be a word, they are the biggest touring band right now. Uh, you know, if the Rolling Stones tour again, which I hear they are, they might uh, be able to compete with an act like U2, but not many can. Okay, moving on here now to number 11, um, another really good album, and when it came out, I was probably a little stronger on it then than I am now, and that is 2004's How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. Um, real good album here, and nothing certainly I don't dislike about it so much as I find others better. Uh, there's some great songs on here. Um, and I'm going to sound like a double standard here a little bit because I was kind of dissing uh, Put On Your Boots. And I'm going to say just the opposite about the first single off this album, Vertigo. For whatever reason, that one resonated with me and I really liked the groove and, and the catchiness of that one. One of the first songs that was uh, kind of an iTunes uh, promotion. Say what you will about iTunes. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, but you two have had somewhat of an affiliation with iTunes now for going on a decade. And... Um, uh, you know, say what you want, but uh, it, it seems to work, and it worked in this case. They had a really, really cool iTunes commercial at the time, and uh, that sticks out. Uh, boy, there's some other great songs on here, though. The City of Blinding Lights is a really, really wonderful track. Uh, All Because of You is another one. And it seems like lately with the 2000 albums, it's kind of like if you can get to the middle. You get to the middle of the album, there's some really great songs. Like the five in the middle are the ones that really pound it for me. And then the stuff in the beginning and the end sometimes fades out a little bit, but the middle of this album is just really wonderful. So anyway, um, not to make this video super long, but uh, 2004's How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb uh, ranks at number 11. So uh, a very fine album, and if you haven't heard it, uh, for those that fell in the middle range of that three-tier group um, that only like the 80s and 90s stuff of you two, check out that one. Okay, moving on to number 10. This is another one of them albums that uh, people either kind of love or hate, 
and I kind of tend to more love it than hate it, even though I'm ranking it number 10. Um, it would still rank highly on uh, overall, you know, how good this album is. And uh, that is from uh, 1997's Pop. Um, I, I wanted to take this out, and then I realized that I've never opened the shrink. Um, it's still in the original shrink, and that's why I don't know what the gatefold looks like. But um, uh, anyway, uh, no big deal there. I'm really talking more about the music, and that's showing the records and the vinyl and all that, so um, it doesn't matter so much. But uh, Discotheque was a great song, is a great song. Um, boy, you know, this is a, just a really, really different album again, much more in that uh, they had that that time period of Zuropa and pop where they were really going outside of their comfort zone and as I said you know you gotta sometimes look a little deeper it's not gonna be uh, Joshua Tree material here but um, there's some great great songs on here Miami um, uh, If You Wear That Velvet Dress is great and Wake Up Dead Man the last track on this album is really really good too so um, an aggressive change of pace for you too and they followed it up with the Pop Mart tour at that time that was, uh, boy, was something spectacular and uh, I believe there's a DVD of that out there. They usually, they usually release a DVD of all their tours and that had a really crazy weird stage and it was uh, just a massive production. Um, okay, moving on to number nine. Uh, it, it, it's tough to put this one in any type of a ranking yet because I'm still letting it kind of marinate and, and I'm getting used to it. I seem to be liking it more and more with each listen, though, and that is uh, this this uh, current album that they have right now, Songs of Innocence. And while I understand that there is controversy and um, unhappiness about the way this album was released, uh, forget all that. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but this is a really, really solid U2 album. And if you don't like it on your iPhone, if you don't like it on your iTunes, just go pick up the record because it changes everything when you hear this on vinyl. I know one of the guys in the VC, um, John Pickles, uh, I believe is his name. I don't know if that's his real name or just a, a made up uh, Facebook name. You know, he was very, very down and negative on this album. I remember seeing some of the comments he was making, not only about the music, but the artwork and how it was released and how dare they, you know, automatically put it in our iPhones didn't ask me, I don't want it, you know, they're invading my privacy and all that bullshit. I'm just going to say it right now. Um, to me, it's just arguments and complaining for the sake of complaining. If you don't want something that's given to you for free, put it in the trash can. I realize it was a little bit difficult to do that. They had to later put an app out to how to delete the album. It's just nonsense. It, I, I never understood it, and I, I don't want to get too much into that because I know there's a lot of strong opinions on the other side of the fence that that is an invasion of privacy and so on and so forth. I, all I can tell you is my opinion, and I think it's absolute rubbish. So anyway, back to the music. This is a really good album. Um, I'm going to show you the inside because if you don't like the picture of the album cover, I'm sure you would appreciate the uh, nice standard, uh, more traditional band photo on the inside, but I'm one of those people that actually really, really like this album cover. This is Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer of U2, uh, and his son. Songs of Innocence is the title of the album, and I think that this protective uh, photo of father and son is actually quite touching and, and meaningful, and it goes perfectly with the music on this album. Uh, has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, a semi-naked boy on the cover. You know, he's he's not a boy, first of all. He's, he's a full-grown adult. And anyway, it's not even worth discussing some of the negativity around why people don't like this cover. Um, if you had read what it's about, I think that those comments that you were making would be absolutely, you'd say, oops, I was a big fool. They had written a whole, Bono had written a whole long, a dissertation on his on their faith on not on their Facebook but on on their website regarding why they chose this they all chose this cover and I would encourage you if it's still there on their um, website to read it because it would maybe change your mind as to why uh, the band decided that this should be the album cover anyway great album here a couple of my favorite tracks are Iris Hold Me Bono wrote that about his mom. A very touching song. A lot of songs on this album are very touching and heartfelt and really deep, meaningful 
back to the core, U2, which is very strong, not only musically, but lyrically. Volcano is a great song also, and Raised by Wolves, you know, and those are all kind of those middle songs again. Um, my opinion again, uh, I think they released the wrong lead single, uh, The Miracle of Joey. Um, didn't like it as much as the rest of the album, so unfortunately that kind of... Uh, made the album stall a little bit again. So, uh, you know, you saw this last week. There was a Record Store Day release of the same album with uh, some different uh, bonus material on the D side. And I still have not opened that. I probably will not open it. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that. I might open it. I'm not sure. Anyway, it, it's the uh, same album, Songs of Innocence, but that's the Record Store Day version. Okay, moving on. Uh, hopefully the end of any controversy... <laughs> Uh, number eight, um, you know, this was a, a time where you two, most people think it's their best period, and um, I, I don't disagree, it's their most commercially successful period, and this album came out right after their biggest commercial success, an album that sold over 25 million copies, um, and while I really like it, um, there was some, some parts of it that I thought were just a little overdone, and uh, that is number eight, Rattle and Hum. Um, a great live album and uh, it really showcased the band at that time and what was important to them. Um, their journey through America, you know, probably their first time really seeing the heart of the country and going to places like um, Me Memphis, Tennessee and uh, the Deep South and really getting into the roots of rock and roll and the blues side of things and um, some great, great standout tracks on here. You all know them quite well, but for me, in the effort of time, I'm just going to let you know that it's um, number eight on my ranking. And um, the concert film, I always enjoy watching it very much. And it's uh, still a very, very good album and uh, one that I spin often. Okay, now it gets kind of harder and harder for the top seven. Boy, this is where it really is going to change a lot throughout my life, I'm sure. Uh, number seven is probably going to surprise a lot of people. But I'd like... I can honestly tell you right now, at this moment in time, I like the albums six through f six through one better. Uh, I'm listening to them more and enjoying them more. And I don't know if it's because a case of over listening or over saturation or too much play or what it is. But number seven for me at this moment in time is the Joshua Tree. And you know why you uh, get up from falling over on the floor and saying, "Oh wow, I thought that would be your number one," and it is their number one album and their most successful album. This is the album that sold 25 million copies. Um, I don't know what it is, but right now, at this moment of time, in time, um, it's just the other albums I like a little bit more, and it could change back. I just don't know. This is the um, remastered uh, vinyl edition of this. Uh, their first six albums have been remastered on uh, 180 gram, and I do have originals, but I just pulled out the remaster just to show you something a little bit different. Um, uh, well, favorite tracks, you know, name one. They're all, they're all classic songs, so there's no point in even doing that, really. Bullet the Blue Sky, though, is probably the song that every time I put it on, I just have to turn up the volume as loud, loud as it'll go. Okay, number, n number um, six is, um, again, another album that, uh, you know, sometimes I think it's their finest moment. Really, I do. And that is from uh, 2000, and that is uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind. Uh, this is uh, one of them times where you two kind of resurrected themselves again and um, came up with new, fresh material that really stands up as well as anything else in their catalog. There's some fantastic songs on here, Beautiful Day, Stuck in a Moment That You Can't Get Out Of, Elevation, Walk On. Uh, just when you think that they couldn't do, they couldn't top themselves anymore, they had nothing left in the tank really that could compare to their best work. They came up with this album in 2000 and um, it is a masterpiece really. I, I would say the, the top six albums in U2's catalogs are all masterpieces and I'm not afraid to say that this was one that belongs in that category. Okay, moving on to number five. Um, all great bands have to start somewhere and um, U2 came out Full Guns Blazing in 1980. 1980, oh my god. I cannot believe that was so long ago. Uh, but 1980's Boy. Again, this is the remastered edition of it. Um, I do have two other versions of this album. I'm just going to show you briefly. The U.S. version, was the cover was quite different than the uh, rest of the world got, um, for whatever reason. Uh, 
the wonderful people at Island Records in the uh, America decided that they didn't like the cover of Boy. And um, shame on them, really, because this is a much better cover. And this is the way the album should be um, looked at. So, um, 1980s Boy, every song on here is a classic, classic song. Um, you know, there's just something about the Electric Company that does it for me. The Edge's guitar work on that is just absolutely, while simple, it's brilliant. Um, boy, uh, I don't know. You know, I've got this at number five and I'm thinking, oh, it's too low. So, it's just a fantastic album. Okay. Number four. Um, this easily could be number one because I've played this album so many times over the years that... Um, this was the first U2 album I ever bought. Uh, I have to admit that this is how, when I discovered the band, um, and I did not discover them with Boy in October, but I discovered them in 1983 with this album, War. And this is kind of when they made it a little bit more popular. They were getting some airplay on MTV, and radio stations were taking note of U2, and they kind of went to a whole different stratosphere. Uh, boy, it went a little bit unnoticed, and October was even more unnoticed. October, I was looking, while I was researching for this video, I only hit number 104 on the charts, and uh, um, uh, Boy hit number 62, so uh, this was a, a big jump up for them. This was a top 10 album, so uh, again, every, every track on here is ones that you know. They've played every song on here multiple times, uh, you know. Um, I don't have a favorite, I guess. Uh, Surrender, maybe, is my favorite track on here because I love the drumming on it. Just that little bit of offbeat uh, uh, drumming that Larry does. Uh, Adam Clayton, the bass player of this uh, on this album, uh, shines for me, too. It's just a, it's a masterpiece. This is one of the finest albums of all time. So it seems almost a shame to put it in number four. Okay, and then number three... Uh, kind of in that same time frame is uh, from 1981's October, another fantastic album. Um, this one I kind of debated, maybe it should be number one, and I'm not joking about that. Uh, I, again, one of them albums that um, some people dismiss, and I don't under quite understand it, because it is absolutely stunning. Gloria, I threw a brick through a window, I fall down, rejoice, tomorrow, October. It was a little bit different than Boy. Boy was very raw. Well, this one's much more polished, and the songwriting had taken a whole different turn. Um, so maybe that threw people off a little bit. Not, not sure what U2 was all about yet in the early 80s. Um, but it's it's a wow album, and if you've never heard it, you know, get out of your cave. Uh, but this is a, uh, a another masterpiece. So, all right, number two, number one. What's going to be number two, and what's going to be number one? Uh, I've done this before, haven't I? Um, I, I'm actually pretty happy with this order. I'm going to stick to it. Number num, number two is um, an album from 1984, and this is The Unforgettable Fire. You all know it. Um, it. It really probably could be their best album for me. It's their finest moment in many, many ways. Brian Eno's magic is all over this album, and for those that know me well know I'm a huge Brian Eno fan. Um, this was their first uh, variation going away from that first three albums, uh, they were similar in some ways to the U2 sound of the 80s when this one was really a, quite a departure. You know, getting away from their regular producer, uh, the name escapes me, I think it was Paul, Paul uh, something. Um, and then going to Brian Eno was a big change for them, a big sound change. And The Unforgettable Fire, I remember hearing it in its entirety the first time ever on the radio and thinking... Was this U2? I don't... It doesn't sound like U2. But it grew on me rapidly. And has, has remained a favorite of mine for a very long time. So, um... U2's... This is, again, the uh, remastered uh, vinyl edition. Uh, I, of course, have a... Uh, I did pull out these uh, regular copies. If anybody is curious, I do have originals. Um, but I'm not showing them in the, in the effort of time. Um, but uh, Unforgettable Fire, every song on here, again, is just wonderful. Um, and, um, you know, um, Bad, I guess, is the song I would pick as my favorite song on that. It's a long, um, 
long song, I believe, about drug abuse and um, maybe the loss of a friend who got swept up in that a little bit. So um, when you hear it live, though, hear the version that's on Wide Awake in America or Wide Awake in Europe, that is the version that will make your heart beat faster because U2 is a fa fabulous, fantastic live band. Um, that's when they shine the most. Um, so to hear that song bad live, it changes everything, really. It, it, that there's something magical about U2 when they, that they play live. They connect at a whole different level that most bands could only aspire to even get close to. Okay, so if you're doing the math, you know there's only one album left, and, and um, I'm going to stick to this because this is another album of change, and you two uh, have not sticked to a formula throughout their 35-plus year career, um, and this one was quite a shock again when it came out because it was quite different, and a radical change again from you 2s sound of the 90s. Uh, or, or the 80s, rather. Uh, this is 1991's Achtung Baby. Um, just a fantastic masterpiece, classic album. Uh, this should belong in everyone's collection in some format. And I encourage you, if you gave up on U2 in the 80s, to at least go this far and listen to Achtung Baby. Um, this, this is the vinyl edition of that, which is somewhat harder to find. And yes, it's the band cover. Um, but, um, you know, just what can you say? I mean, I just don't even know what to say. I'm at a loss for words, really. Every song on here deserves to be heard, and I would put probably at least three quarters of the album in some of my top songs of all time. So this is uh, the epitome of the U2's catalog. Um, you know, I guess I could say it about uh, so many different things that I was showing you. Unforgettable Fire and War and... October and Boy and obviously Octung Baby and the Joshua Tree and all that you can't leave behind and all of them, you know, really, other than maybe one or two little hiccups where I'm saying, you know, they're not perfect albums, really, the top seven albums on U in U2's catalog are pretty well perfect for me. So that wraps it up. I'm sorry, again, I always say I'm sorry about length, but, you know, I keep getting comments that, hey, don't worry about the length, that we really like your video, so maybe I should stop saying sorry. Um, uh, you know, I guess since we are, you know, going this long, I might as well go a little bit longer and just show you a couple nice things that I've got, too. I've got some remastered, expanded editions of the CDs. This little box set has their first four, three studio albums and um, Under a Blood Red Sky in these uh, deluxe edition CDs that I think each have three discs. Let's just take a look at, uh, let's take a look at War. Um, I haven't looked at these in quite some time. Well, i got to get it out. <laughs> uh, it comes in a nice little book. It looks like a uh, hardbound book, really. So let's see here. There's uh, the one CD, and yeah, just sorry, just two CDs. It's got a lot of bonus material, and frankly, I, I need to to invest more time and hear some of the bonus material on it, uh, but uh, they are really nice. And it's a wonderful box, so I'm glad I bought it when I did because I was just out of curiosity. I was online one day with my very good friend James Lack. Hey James. Um, and we were looking at the price of this because we were kind of saying, hey, you know, maybe we should get a box set. Let's let's look at box set CDs. And I thought, I told James, I said, yeah, you ought to get this U2, this box set. And it was like, crazy money. It was like $400 or something, if I remember. It's like, okay, never mind. Uh, let's find something else here. So I think that's when you bought uh, Pink Floyd or something like that. So, um, crazy. I don't know why. And then I do have these deluxe um, remastered edition CD boxes as well of uh, The Unforgettable Fire and uh, The Joshua Tree, which are just really, really well done. This has uh, two CDs and a DVD a bonus DVD of different concert footage and the making of and um, you know I'm gone quite a long time here I don't want to make this a 40 minute video but I'm getting close here anyway I, I'll, I'll just save it for if anybody wants to see photos I'll just let me know and I'll post them on Facebook um, so anyway um, just wanted to kind of show off a little bit my uh, box sets that I have and I wish there was one for Octum I guess there is one for Octum Baby Daniel Daniel I, my good friend in the VC, you have something really special and unique, uh, Octung baby-wise, that you got for some crazy steal. 
think he paid like a quarter of what it was supposed to be. You got a great deal at Best Buy or something, if I remember right. So I I envy you because you've got a box set of my favorite U2 album of all time, Octung Baby. So if you ever get bored with U2, you know where it should go. All right, guys. So thank you so much for tuning in again and sticking with me for 35 minutes. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have, please like, comment, and subscribe. Um, I'm doing really well with uh, a young channel and uh, all your comments and likes again mean so much to me and appreciate all my subscribers very much well that's it for this week um next week we'll be back with a another update uh got a few things brewing so we'll just wait and see what what mood strikes me at that time and uh look forward to seeing you all again in uh, about seven days so take care have a great weekend and we'll see you real soon bye bye